This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. There's one block in Manhattan that even without a major corporation, a too-big-to-fail bank, or a magnificent mansion that's worth billions of dollars. It's 47th Street between 5th and 6th Avenues, the home of New York City's diamond and jewelry district. Even while it thrives, the 47th Street Business Improvement District is busy making plans for its future. And Michael Gromet is its executive director, and he's my guest today. So, hi. Hi, thank you for having me. Here. Thank you. And when we, we talk about the Diamond District, um, but it's really two industries we're talking about, right? The jewelry and the Diamond District. Diamond. Yes. And, and the street is even named? The name of the street is Diamond and Jewelry Way. That's great. But it's still West 47th Street. It's West 47th Street, and I want to encourage everyone to come down and go shopping. Well, they should, and it's fun, and there's great products there. So, what's the history of, this, of the Diamond Center in New York? It, there, there have been three centers in New York. It originally started down at Maiden Lane and Nassau Street. When was um, this about when? 1800s. Uh -huh. um, so there have been jewelers here for a long time. Mm -hmm. Then they moved up to Canal and Bowery. And after World War II, the manufacturers needed more space at a reasonable price, so they moved to Midtown, and the retailers followed. And the, it's always because it was somebody from someplace. I mean, it just the jewelry business or diamond business didn't just spring up like a, <laughs> a flower. I mean, people came here from other places bringing their skills. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, and especially um, during World War II, right. we had a tremendous number of, of immigrants who came here and brought their skills. Because of the, the jewelry, because of the Nazis in Germany yes. and other thing was going on. Yes. It's a large Jewish population of diamond sellers. Um, Cutters? Mid middlemen, mostly. Yeah, mid yeah. Middlemen, mostly. The, um, what people don't realize is that the majority of the population in the Diamond District, over 70%, are women and minorities. I consider the Diamond District um, a little UN. It's a microcosm of New York. We have Russians, we have Persians, we have Chinese, tremendous number of Indians, Syrians, you name it. It's there on the street, and everyone speaks their, <laughs> their own language. It's so great. I know when you walk down the street, it's just a uh, create. It, it's such excitement. I know some people think it's chaos, but I think it's great excitement. And New York, there are several jewelry diamond centers in the world. Yes. Right. I always used to think Antwerp was the place. Antwerp is a is a cutting center, and New York is a cutting center. The amazing thing about New York, America accounts for thirty five percent of the sales of all diamonds in the world. At thirty five percent. Thirty five percent. And the uh, um, and we're a twenty four point two billion dollar a year industry. To put that in perspective for you, twenty four billion dollars a year is what McDonald's does in sales worldwide. So our one little street does that. It's a major industry. It's a major industry, and we're a major economic engine for New York State. Right. We're the first, third, and fourth largest export from New York State. I was going to say that the diamonds that are here, the 35% or whatever it is, gets exported as well as here. Yes, all over the country. the country. They're, they're brought in <laughs> mostly as rough stones, mm -hmm. and then they're cut here. Mm -hmm. um, what people don't realize, we're more than just a retailing center. We're vertically integ integrated. We, do, we have retailing, wholesaling, manufacturing, and manufacturing in the diamond trade means cutting and polishing. Um, the, it's and most of the business that goes on is not only on, on the floor level. It's all the buildings upstairs uh, where the real trading is go on, goes on. There's actually a diamond bourse, a diamond exchange, just like um, a stock exchange or a commodities exchange. Where are they? They're in, they're in Antwerp. Antwerp. Mumba, uh, in India? In India. Uh -huh. um, there, I think there are 29 exchanges. Hong Kong? I th Hong Kong. I'm not exactly sure, mm -hmm. but I think London. There are 29 right. different bourses around right. the world. But there aren't that many diamond centers, are no. there? No. This, this is, we say we're the center of the diamond universe. Right. So a diamond gets mined. Yes. Then what happens to it? 
Well, um, diamonds are mined. Now all diamonds um, are part of the Kimberley process. That means they're certified as coming from, they're clean diamonds, they're not conflict diamonds. Which means? Which means they're not from the Congo, they don't support um, rebel activities, and it gets a certification. From, from when it's mined until it reaches the consumer, it's tracked, and so Americans can be sure that all diamonds they buy in this country are conflict-free diamonds. Explain how that came about, because usually something like that is a response to protest. Um, there was a tremendous amount of protest. Uh, by whom? Um, by people who were not happy what was going on in Africa and how diamonds were fueling um, conflicts right. in, in, in Africa. But it wasn't only the government. The government passed laws, but it's been the industry that has responded and the leaders of this, it's a triumvirate of government, industry, government, industry, and nonprofit organizations that work together to certify this. The amazing thing, the majority of diamonds that come into the United States, the first largest country that exports them is Botswana. And they have a tremendous program. They've used their mineral wealth to help their citizens and increase their standard of living. The second largest, I'm not sure if it's Russia or Canada, but you can be sure that all diamonds that come into America are conflict free. That's so interesting. Where do the De Beers diamonds come? De Beers are, are mostly Africa, but De Beers was a, um, and is still a um, conglomerate, and they very much control the trading of diamonds. Um, but Swan, the government of Botswana owns a large part of it. The Oppenheim family sold their shares recently, and um, <laughs> where they get their individual diamonds, I can't tell you. Does De Beers, are people connected to De Beers on 47th Street? No. no that's a no. separate, it's, 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 it's a it's, large separate. <clears throat> it's a large separate. I mean, peop, De Beers has something called site holders, where people go and, and it's not easy to become a site holder, and then you get stones from them. Um, and there are people on 47th Street who are site holders of De Beers, but De Beers has also become a retailer and they're not located on 47th Street. Right. But, the, but now let's go back to 47th Street. So when you're walking down the street and you see all these arcades with a lot of different booths or... We call them exchange. Exchange. Oh, each arcade is an exchange. Is an exchange. And they can so, have as much as 100 different individual retailers in each exchange. Right. And the amazing thing about that is they're all competing, and they're competing on price, and they're competing on service. Um, so we say competition breeds good pricing. So we're the best place to shop. <laughs> yes, and you can go from one place to another. And, and you encourage get, people to do that. We really do, and that's how people get an education. Mm -hmm. I say there are two ways to get an education about diamonds. One is to go to my website, www.diamonddistrict.org, we have a whole section on how to be an educated, informed consumer of diamonds and jewelry, and also what you should know about getting on your receipt and what the laws are about selling um, returns, returns, everything, every, everything you should know. Um, and the other thing we say is just go from merchant to merchant. Um, a diamond, the old saying is a diamond is forever. You don't want to make a, <laughs> a choice of something like that quickly. Go and talk to people. Another way to find a good, reputable merchant is also to go on my website. I have something called my Buyer's Bill of Rights program, which merchants on this street, they're all certified by the Better Business Bureau and the Department of Consumer Affairs, and um, they're excellent merchants. But that's not including all the merchants that are there. No, no, it's not all the merchants that but are there. But could they could volunteer, voluntarily try to join your yes. list? Yes, yes. I mean, you're not keeping anybody off. Unless, um, unless they have issues right. with Department of Consumer Sorry, Affairs there's. or Better Business Bureau. So why aren't why isn't everybody on it? Um, there's a fee, uh. and <laughs> it makes more sense for people in the window booths to join us because that's where people can see their stickers. I see. So the buildings themselves that are housing mm -hmm. these different trades, um, I don't know if that's the right word, are are owned by real estate people. Um, that's the surprising thing. Yeah. Until recently, the majority of the buildings were owned by jewelers. The people, the people who moved there and, and was a jeweler and said, 
all right, we're doing well, we'll buy a building. And it, we haven't had major real estate development on the street until recently. Now you have this new building going up. Yes. Very tall. Yes, I think it's going to be 34 stories. And it's a beautiful building, and we're looking forward to its and, finishing construction. And it will be then, we don't know, office space. Um, it, hopefully, they will be attracting jewelers from all over the world to come there. And, and what happens to the other buildings? They have to bring in new, build, new people. They, hopefully, they will be bringing in new people. Um, there are always new people coming to New York. Always, That's the amazing thing about the Diamond District. There are a tremendous number of immigrants, over 70% over Seventy percent of the people are immigrants who work in the diamond and jewelry industry. Um, so there's always new blood coming in, and um, there has to be a space for them. It's one of the strong points, isn't it, about New York being the diamond center, is that it has all these different jewelers who take care of specific aspects of the development of the piece. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, there are people who specialize, just on the retail level, there are people who specialize in selling diamonds, there are people who specialize in selling pearls, um, colored stones. All the colored stones that you see on QVC and Home Shopping Network, yeah. they pass through my street. I'm um, not wearing my pearls because they need to be restrung, <laughs> and I bring haven't them in, taken I'll, them down for Bring them in months. Or, or give me a call and I'll tell you, who to, <laughs> tell you who to go to. Well, I didn't mean to have a special favor, but anyway, it would be nice. We get calls like that all the time, and yeah. we're happy to answer well, them. That's so great. So um, there, that's a strong advantage for New York as a center, as compared to a few other centers around the world, is that you do have all this whole, this from beginning to end service, isn't Oh, it? yes, yes. Once, once again, um, we are a manufacturing center. Yeah. There are over 400 manufacturers in, the di in New York City in the Diamond area. And they, we have foundries where people smelt gold, um, which is astonishing to think of. Right in one of those buildings? In several of those buildings. Isn't that something. Um, so it's a real well, factory. It, it's a factory. Um, we have at, um, bench jewelers. Those are the people that still hand make jewelry. And it's astonishing. You go there and you see them um, pulling platinum. And it's, it's, it's the best thing about um, the diamond industry in New York. And the reason it's been able to thrive here is that we need very little space for, for manufacturing. Um, a diamond cutter could be sitting at a table this size. Um, the tools are the same that's been used for several year, several years and it's really minimal amounts of space for high dollar value products. Let's just go back for one minute and then we'll change the subject. A dime first there's the mining. Yes. Then there is the cutting. Yes. Then there's the polishing. Oh they're, they're tremendous. What happens? They're Where does it get designed? I mean when, who designs decides what to do with that there diamond? There are there are jewelry designers. Yeah. Um, and a large a large number of the other stores that are not on 47th Street um, on the Upper East Side use our services to manufacture their jewelry. I see. Um, but there are also jewelry designers and there are jewelry shows. There's a jewelry show in New York, there's a large one in Las Vegas. There are jewelry shows all over the world where manufacturers go and then show their goods to retailers who then sell it to so the public. So how does a diamond the that comes out that, that is mined in Africa. Mm -hmm. Where does it then go, if it doesn't come here directly, where does it go? Could it go to Antwerp or someplace it to, can go, to be cut? It can go to Antwerp um, to be cut. If it's a very small stone, it will go to India to be cut. The Pave and Mele stones are cut in, mostly cut in India. Um, but the larger stones come here as rough, oh. and they are cut here. So New York is really known as a higher Yes. What do you call that? A, a higher class, a, a bigger. We have um, <laughs> higher quality stones, higher quality larger stones. stones. But how does a stone physically get here? Airplane. <laughs> and, and who brings it? Huh? Um, the the people who buy it. The people who buy rough. And where are they? Who are they? Um, <laughs> I don't think, for security reasons, they really want to be known who I they see. are. <laughs> It's in, in that one way, it's a very secretive industry because people are dealing with very high dollar value goods and um, they prefer to keep their profiles very low because it's easily transportable. 
Is it a family industry that the yes. trade is handed down from one generation to another? That, um, it's very much been. I don't mean trade, the skill. No, but it, but it is a trade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, there are skills. There are setters, there are cutters, there are polishers. Um, there are a number of steps that have to be done to take a raw stone that you're asking about, have it cut, set, and polished, and then appear as a piece of fine jewelry. And in the diamond district, we're looking forward to the next century. And in addition to the old handcrafts that have traditionally been the way of doing this, um, many of the now jewelry designers, cutters, um, use the most advanced technology. They use CAD design. Um, so what does CAD stand for? Do you know? Got me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but how do they learn these new skills? They learn the skills to say most of the skill most of the skills are passed on through apprenticeships nice. and um, hope the bid is one to establish a program to teach these skills to have another generation of cutters, setters, and polishers so we can continue to be a, a center for the world diamond and jewelry. Let's talk about the business improvement district because mm -hmm. it's important in the future mm -hmm. of, of this industry and we've already established it's a mm -hmm. very important industry in this country and in the state and in the city. They, we, they are, uh, they produce revenue for us, right? Yes. It's a, so we want to protect it <laughs> and we want it to grow. Right. So we have a business improvement district. The business improvement district was formed 16 years ago. Um, like most business, like most of the business improvements in New York, we do safety and security. We have the most advanced um, security cameras that exist. We have the same ones as the police department does. We got a Homeland Security grant to do that, $100,000. We were the only bid in the country, I think, that's ever gotten a Homeland Security grant. Um, but we do more. We do marketing, uh, we do public relations, government relations. Um, we're a tiny organization because we get our funding through assessment and we're only one block, mostly small buildings. Um, but we do other things. We, we work with government. We got Empire State Development, which is the state's economic development agency, to fund a research project for us, which hadn't been done in 24, over 20 years, looking at the economic impact of the diamond and jewelry industry in New York. And uh, I've read that, and it makes some suggestions also about the future. Yeah, there are a number so, of things we'd like yeah. we, we'd like to do. We'd like to work more with the hospitality trades. We're a tourist center. Right. We'd like to have more help from the city and state government. Um, to do marketing for our district because people come to New York to buy diamonds and jewelry and we should be letting we should be letting the rest of the world know that hey come here we're a great place to shop you sell both wholesale and retail yes yes it's yes <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it's hard to determine which is which people think that when they're buying retail that they're really getting wholesale prices well, they are in a, in a way, they're getting less they're, than... They're, they're not getting wholesale price. And if anyone ever says, let me sell it to you at wholesale, I would go somewhere else. Yeah. Um, they will get a competitive price that's less than their local jeweler, jeweler and less than other places in New York, but it's not wholesale. Um, wholesale really is just to the trade. It's an interesting difference. <laughs> well... You want to promote good business Well, and business you still practices. want the trade, too. You need yes. the trade. That's the basic. Right. That's the major part of it, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. 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 So, so the bid also is, it seems to me, it wants the training programs that would like to affiliate with some institutions that teach skills and stuff. We might want to affiliate. We, our no, ultimate, I mean, you're uh, thinking about our it. Our ultimate goal is to actually offer, offer those training programs yes, ourselves sure. um, because the, it's been a... Traditionally, the skills have been passed down through generation to generation, and we think the manufacturers would be more comfortable if, um, if that was continued to be done through an organization that's closely allied with them, like right. the BID. It's like, I guess, life in general. I mean, if you're the fourth generation, you decide you don't want to go into the family business. Right. Who's going to come in instead of you, right? Well, there will be someone who comes yeah. in. He may not be uh, from the same area as you are, uh -huh. um, but there will always be a diamond and jewelry industry in New York. It's an interesting kind of thing, isn't it? Right. And what about um, how you apprentice? How does one get to be an apprentice? 
It's difficult. <laughs> it's usually through knowing someone because there is such high dollar value to the items. So okay. people are very reticent of taking a stranger into their mists um, who could just walk off with, with stock. Um, there are a number of excellent programs in jewelry design. FIT has a great program here in New York and we're, we haven't quite gotten an answer to that yet, how, how, how to go forward with that. It um, it's all seems to be a very, it has to be, I guess, a very close industry. It's a very... There's a lot of room there for it, distrust. <laughs> well, the traditional ways still happen. People shake hands and say mazel and brucha, and that, mean it, that means the deal is sealed, and um, there may not be written contracts. Um, though it's getting more and more formalized, better business practices are, are taking place. There's still something in the industry called on memo, where someone will be given a diamond or, or emerald or other stone for a certain amount of time, and that's not recognized as a legal contract in New York. It's the only industry that, that works that way. And we don't encourage people in the, business, in the industry to keep doing that because there are no protections for them in doing that. And your website, you also encourage people to always get a receipt. Always get a receipt. Uh. Always get a receipt. It's, we encourage people to pay with credit cards, get a receipt. Um, there are requirements from New York City of what should be on that receipt, what the merchant's return policies are. Um, but yes, and on the receipt, it should also say exactly what you're getting. You need to know if you're getting, um, there are four C's of diamonds, color, cut, cl carity, clarity, and carrot. That should be on the receipt. Um, um, you should know if there are any flaws in the diamond or a colored stone, if it's been heat treated, if it's been color enhanced. And you want to ask these things of the merchant. So, once again, I want to encourage everyone to go to the website, www.diamonddistrict.org, and learn about this. And you also learn about gold. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. And, and platinum. And gold, platinum, yeah. palladium. Emeralds, rubies. Emeralds, rubies, <laughs> pearls. Right. Um, there are other organizations that you work with. I mean, there's a yes. general diamond organization. What's that called? There, well, there are, there are a number of nonprofit organizations. There's the Diamond Manufacturers and Porters Association, the DMIA. Is the Diamond Dealers now, wait, Club. Let's do it one at a time. Okay. Who belongs to that organization? Those are the large manufacturers on the street. And they are sometimes they're the people who own the, the, the buildings stuff. and everything. No, not no, really. not necessarily. No, okay. they're very no. Yeah. The ones who owned the buildings were mostly the retailers. Ah. Um, the Diamond Manufacturers and Porters Association are just what they sound sound like. They are people who buy stones, cut them and then sell them to retailers. Uh, and they have certain standards. I or hope don't so. they? <laughs> <laughs> well, what's, yes. Yeah. Yes, of course they yeah. do. And then you were talking about another organization? There's something called the DDC, the, the Diamond Dealers Club, and that is a bourse, an exchange on the street. Um, and they're also a nonprofit organization, and that's where people come, people in the trade come to buy and buy stones, buy and sell stones among themselves. Do they buy and sell right on the street? Not, no, no, no. It, it, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> it's to, not that to, romantic to, or exciting. It doesn't make sense to buy and sell on the street because you have thousands of dollars in your hands. You need a, a private place to do that. It's so incredible. Do, when they bring the diamonds over uh, from <laughs> Europe or wherever, do they do it like diplomatic pouches with? Some might, but most of the most of the time it's shipped. It's oh, so it, I see. So, so, so you it can be insured. Yeah. And the the diamond and jewelry industry support a tremendous number amount of other industries, including sh including shipping, um, manufacturing, um, insurance. Um, so it's a multiplier effect. It's so interesting. So a diamond <laughs> is forever. Uh huh. Hopefully. And it goes behind it. It has levels and levels of people who have come to support your acquisition of this diamond. Yes, and then you can have it and enjoy it and pass it on uh, for generations to come. Yeah. And your descendants, if styles can change, can have that same stone recut, reset, 
So a diamond really is forever. And they can do that right on 47th Street. They should do it on 47th Street. <laughs> and Michael, how, how, how have much have you learned? Everything since Every, you've been there? I, um, I didn't know very much about diamonds and jewelry before taking the job. And it's been a wonderful process. Jewelers are very giving with their information to me, and um, I enjoy it tremendously. And you, in turn, are giving information to others. I hope so. So, <laughs> so everybody should go to your website, uh -huh. and then they should go to 47th Street. And walk up and down the street. And enjoy it. And enjoy it. It's, yeah. a, it, it's great just to go window shopping. There are price points on the street for everyone. That means you can go in and you can buy a little trinket for silver trinket for ten dollars. Well, maybe not anymore. Silver has gone up in price recently. <laughs> um, but there, um, there are things Tiny for move. things for everyone. You can buy a, a a charm for your bracelet, or you can buy a million dollar ring. And um, you can buy an antique, and you can buy a very ultra modern. Yes, and it's not only diamonds and jewelry. Once again, it's colored stones, it's pearls, it's watches. Um, anything that's jewelry and fine collectibles. So go and enjoy. Thank and you. thank you, Michael Grumet. Thank, thank you. you very much. Is there any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore? Please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.